Someone recently asked me, how could a post-scarcity society come about? Isn't that utopian? What kind of magical levels of efficiency of production would we need before we could just supply the human race with everything we need to live comfortable lives? Well, the thing is, we're already at the point where our means of production could supply every human being on this planet with essentially everything that's needed to live a comfortable life. Our modern means of production are extremely effective. In fact, in some ways, they are too effective. Our current economic system suffers from overproduction. We produce more than we could ever hope to consume. But because of the market, the things that are produced are produced for profit rather than human need. Instead of producing water filters for Africa, we produce Nintendo Switches. With a rationally and democratically planned economy, we could give every person on the planet enough to live a healthy and comfortable life while still being able to cut down on production. Fewer people would have to work in factories and they could spend more time doing the things that they actually want to do in their day to day and less pollution would be created. We have seen the effects of unregulated markets and privatization with a neoliberal ideology sweeping through Europe. Its effects are increased segregation, lower quality healthcare and education, homelessness and unemployment. So, what do socialists believe specifically is wrong with capitalism? Well, capitalism is a system that allows for anyone that has sufficient capital to create a business and produce anything that they want, however they want, with no regard for democracy in the workplace, equal work participation, the owner of the business does not have to work, or indeed, how the rest of society is doing. A capitalist does not have to care about whether or not what their business is producing is necessary for society. All a capitalist has to worry about is making a profit. And capitalists don't decide that it's time to stop making money once they reach a certain net worth. On the contrary, capitalists are never content and they continually seek to make as much money as possible. Capitalism, that is the system of free markets and private ownership that we have now, relies on exponential profits and growth. Every year a company's profit must go up. Every year a country's GDP must go up. If it stagnates or, God forbid, falls by a percentile, the company or country is failing. But if every company's profit must go up and every country's GDP must go up, that means that we must continually produce more and more goods, more cars, more planes, more tanks, more fast food, more coke, more additional pylons. That means more factories and more pollution, primarily in third world nations. Europe is what some call a post-industrial society. We don't have factories anymore, but we still consume just as much, if not more, than when we did have factories. The truth is, we do still have factories. Swedish, German, French companies still do own factories and do still employ factory workers. Only the factories are in China, Vietnam, India, Bangladesh, Ethiopia, Senegal, Kenya, Tanzania. When we Europeans figured out that pollution is bad and that factory workers are prone to becoming self-aware and unionizing, we moved our factories to the third world and proudly declared ourselves post-industrial. The earth does not have infinite resources. There is no room for infinite growth infinite profit, infinite GDP, on a planet that is increasingly finite. And mere regulation of the market will not solve this issue. It would only fight the symptom, but not the cause. Private companies exist with one sole purpose, profit. Everything else is secondary. In a planned economy, on the other hand, the economy is rationally and democratically planned. Not necessarily from the top down, but in a grassroots fashion, with every town, village, city district deciding how to manage their economy in a way that will guarantee the health and well-being of their citizens. But some would say that planned economies simply don't work. Planned economies have been tried before, and you can say what you will about the political or philosophical aspects of countries like the Soviet Union, but they didn't have unemployment, they didn't have homelessness. Everyone was guaranteed free healthcare and education. 
When the United States of America was having the Great Depression, the Soviet Union was industrializing. When America had 40 million people in poverty, the Soviet Union guaranteed relative financial stability to every citizen. According to the Soviet Union's constitution, every citizen had the right to work in exchange for a decent wage, and every citizen had the right to a home to live in and food on their plate. And look, I'm not here to say that the Soviet Union was perfect, or that it was even ultimately good, but disregarding everything else about the country and only looking at the economic side, their planned economy worked. And when they switched to a capitalist free market in 1991, the economy crashed. Mass poverty, mass unemployment, alcoholism and suicide rates shot through the roof. The Russian elections had to be rigged so that people wouldn't vote for the Communist Party to be back in power. And even today, a majority of Russians say that they want the Soviet Union back. The same goes for the majority of East Germans, Romanians, Tajiks, Uzbeks, Kyrgyz and Armenians. But a planned economy doesn't have to look like the planned economy of the Soviet Union. There is no reason that we would take a system that worked in Russia 30 years ago and not adapt it to the specific circumstances of the 21st century and whichever country the new system is being implemented in. The main economic argument against planned economy is based on information. The government bureaucrats have to keep track of so much information and make so many calculations that the system ends up ineffective. But it's 2019. We have supercomputers now. If you're interested in what a modern planned economy aided by modern technology could look like, I recommend researching Project Cybersyn, which was a Chilean experiment in 1971 that aimed to create a distributed decision support system to aid in the management of the national economy. And I mean, pretty much all stock trading is done by computers these days. So it's not like computers running the economy is unheard of. The difference is that under capitalism, the goal is profit. And under socialism, with the planned economy, the goal is human well-being. And for all you freedom-loving libertarians out there, let me make something clear. A planned economy does not require a strong authoritarian government that represses political opponents or constructs prison camps. Burkina Faso showed us that. And a capitalist free market does not require a small government that respects the rights of its citizens. Not to Germany, Pinochet's Chile, fascist Spain, imperial Japan. The economic mode of production does not dictate the political structure of the government. The fact that planned economies have often been accompanied by authoritarian government is mainly due to the fact that those countries, the Russian Empire and the Chinese dynasties, have always had authoritarian governments. The Russian Empire wasn't a beacon of individualism and human rights before the Bolsheviks. But when planned economies were introduced in countries with history of democracy and human rights, those values remained. Again, like in Chile. Okay, this all sounds well and good, but socialism and planned economy, that's just too extreme. Can't we just have the best of both worlds? A sort of mixed system? Half socialism, half capitalism? Well, such a system exists. It's called social democracy. Social democracy is a system that, by definition, advocates for social justice within the framework of a capitalistic economy. It serves not as an alternative to capitalism itself, but rather a different, friendlier version of it. To many, the social democratic system seems like a good middle ground between capitalism and socialism. But social democracy is a system built not only on the exploitation of the workers in the country it is established, but also on imperialistic exploitation of the global south's third world countries. Social democracy is not viable without the luxury that cheap offshore labor provides. If conditions for the workers in a third world country improve, for example, child labor is outlawed and the 12-hour workday is changed to an 8- or 6-hour workday, the standards of living in social democratic countries fall. Remember when I talked about European countries proudly declaring themselves de-industrialized or post-industrialized? All the while, all of those factories that used to be in Europe are now in India or Africa? Well, that's because it's just cheaper to have the factories there. But if it wasn't cheap, if the people in those countries had better living conditions, it wouldn't be profitable to have factories there. And even if 
social democracy to you seems like a viable alternative to full-on free market capitalism and full-on planned socialism. The fact remains, social democracy still expects that every company will have positive growth every year. Every country will have positive GDP growth every year. But as I explained, this is unsustainable. Our planet is not infinitely large. In short, taxes and redistributionism only attack the symptoms, not the cause. The cause is free market capitalism. That is why socialists oppose it. Socialists believe in common ownership of enterprise, the productivity of which will be used to benefit all of society, not just the CEOs. I hope that you found this video interesting. I obviously couldn't mention everything, as that would take, I mean, hours upon hours, but if you're still thirsty for knowledge, then may I recommend my website, socialism101.com, dedicated to thoroughly explaining the basics of socialism to those who are new. In other news, I've created a Patreon page, patreon.com forward slash Azure Scapegoat. There are currently three tiers that you can get, $5, $10, $100. They come with rewards that I hope you will find satisfactory. Otherwise, revel in the satisfaction of helping me make more YouTube videos which will educate the masses in socialist theory and bring the downfall of capitalism ever so closer. I want to thank you for 18,000 subscribers. By the time this video goes up I might actually be at 19,000 because I've been growing like crazy lately. Thank you again and I will see you next time. Shall we still be slaves and work for wages? It is outrageous, has been for ages. Oh, this earth by right belongs to toilers and not to spoilers of liberty. The master class is small, but they have lots of gall. When we unite to gain our right, if they resist, we'll use our might. There is no middle ground. This fight must be one round to victory for liberty. Our class is marching on. Shall we still be slaves and work for wages?